Hello YouTube, Sidekick here with another iron bombing, I don't know, tutorial, familiarization video. Um, so, I, you know, about a year and a half ago I started doing a little project on my channel. I decided that I would basically do a tour of all of the DCS iron bombers. Like, an actual iron bomber's guide to the DCS galaxy. I'd already done an awful lot on the A4, so I went forward to the Harrier, and then I took a trip to the Red Side and looked at the Su-25, both the A and the T versions. And then we rolled even farther forward into the A-29, and then I started working my way backwards to the 50s with the F-86, and to the 40s with the P-47 and the Mosquito. But, of course, there is one iron bomber I haven't given the sidekick treatment to, and that would be the iron bomber, the ultimate expression of the Iron Bomber's art, a plane designed with no other mission in mind than moving mud, taking names, and changing minds. A plane designed for high payloads, long loiter times, and massive payloads. I speak, of course, of the A-10 Thunderbolt II, known to one and all, of course, as the Hog. A plane that in some sense has outlived its own era. Today's A-10, the C version, is a high-tech, fully networked, precision-guided munitions delivery platform. It uses its large payload and long loiter time to orbit the battlefield, dispensing precision-guided death from nowhere in particular. But that's not how it started out life. It started out as, literally, the ultimate iron bomber. The product of three decades and several major conflicts worth of experience in trying to figure out how to effectively get high explosives from an airplane to where they would do the most good at helping troops on the ground get the job done. It was not designed to be easy on the eyes, but it was designed to carry a massive payload, pack a huge punch and with a 30mm cannon, and to survive in a high-threat environment by being tougher and more resilient than anything with wings had ever been before. So, today we're in the A-10, but not the shiny new C model. No, nope, we are in the OG hog, the A-10A. Uh, the A-10A is one of the Flaming Cliffs uh, airplanes, or FC-3 airplanes in DCS. Uh, that does mean that the cockpit and systems are lower fidelity than the newer DCS aircraft, and that difference um, is noticeable, I will admit. But it's also available at about uh, one-fifth the price of the C version. And, as an iron bomber, there really is nothing like it. Now, you will have noticed uh, that even though the startup was very brief, um, I didn't, uh, I was actually able to accomplish it using cockpit clicks. Um, and this is a very exciting development. There is a new mod that adds clickable cockpits to FC-3 aircraft. Uh, I just found out about it uh, when I was making this video, and I haven't really had time to include uh, anything more about it in the video. Uh, because this video is really just going to be a trip out to the range to compare the hog to the other iron bombers in terms of delivering weapons. But... If there is enough interest, I can do another video that's a bit more of a basic intro to the A-10A, including the new clickable cockpit mod. For now, though, we're ready to uh, head out to the runway. So let's just get ourselves out here and lined up. As usual, we're taking off from Kobaletti and out to the uh, Caucasus Iron Bombing Test Range, as I call it. We are using the Target Information Test Script again today to... Uh, uh, evaluate our drops and um, this is a new version of the range mission I've actually modified it now uh, so that you don't actually have to call your roll-ins and your uh, clear off the range anymore um, that's accomplished automatically um, it's still kind of in beta version because it gives me trouble every once in a while so uh, if anybody would like to try the new mission just uh, come to the discord channel and send me a, a, a private message and I'll hook you up with a copy all right, here we are getting down the runway. The A-10 doesn't get into the air in a hurry, like the Harrier, for instance. But we are carrying a fairly significant load, carrying four Mavericks of two different species, carrying six 500-pound bombs, Mark 82s. We are carrying 38 2.75-inch rockets, and of course, we're carrying the gun. The gun, of course, is the GAU 830mm Gatling gun. That was essentially the primary weapon system that the A-10 was actually designed around, and we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the other thing I do want to notice is that I did say, yes, we are carrying Maverick missiles today. 
Now, uh, and there you can see them under the wing pylons. Now, uh, I will admit that uh, Maverick missiles are not iron bombs, um, but it really would not be fair to fly the A-10 uh, without putting some Mavericks on board, because um, in a sense, the Mavericks were a really important weapon system for the A-10, especially in the first uh, Gulf War, and, and that's basically really the heyday of the A-10A was uh, the Gulf War. After that, more weapons like the Mavericks started coming online, and the A-10 underwent its transmission, transition to the C model and basically became a precision-guided munitions platform rather than an iron bomber. So. It's a little bit fun to actually take a look at the Mavericks. They are a fairly early incarnation, and the, the other important thing is that uh, we don't have a targeting pod uh, in this version of the A-10, so you do at least have to fly the aircraft at the target in order for the Mavericks to be able to acquire it. So it's a bright, clear day here on the shores of the Black Sea. As we're getting to get out to the range, we'll, we'll start with the longer range weapons and work our way in close. So we're going to start with the Mavericks here. And uh, you can see the little, uh, you can see the little um, reticle on screen, basically. I'm going to steer that, and I'm just cycling through the different weapons here. Those are the Mark 82s from CCIP mode. And you can see the weapon stations are highlighted with the green dots there. So those are the rockets on the outboard pylons, and there we go. Those, that's the TV-guided Mavericks, which are the, the weapons that we're going to use first. So we'll just turn in here. Uh, we need to be fairly far back from the range, a lot farther back than we usually are. Um, Mavericks can usually acquire targets. It's somewhere uh, around six nautical miles, and you can usually launch them pretty soon after that. Um, I would say that the Maverick performance in the A-10 versions Maybe uh, a, a little bit optimistic in terms of its ability to acquire targets. I think it's a little bit more realistic in the A-10C, but it still uh, makes it a very usable system in the A-10A version. So we'll just get out here. There's the range off to the left. Let's go a little bit farther east here, and then we're going to turn in. Uh, so there's a two-stage system with acquiring a target. The first thing you do is move the reticle close to the target area. Uh, and then you click to, uh, it, it's called target lock, but essentially it's a ground stabilization. So you ground stabilize the reticle, and then you look through the camera view and uh, pick up the target, and when the crosshairs lock on the target, then you are ready to fire. So here we go, we're rolling in, that's the target area there. So I'll get the reticle somewhere in the middle, ground stabilize it. You see now it has a cross in the middle, and I'm just going to see there. We've got a good target. I don't like that one, though. That's just there. That's good. That's probably an M113. And the other thing we want to do is keep the cross fairly close. The flashing cross on the television needs to be fairly close to the center line. And the range is down under five nautical miles, so rifle. Now, of course, the Maverick is fire and forget. We don't have to follow it in like I'm doing. I'm just... Uh, just doing that to see if I can see. That's probably not worth it. Uh, I don't think I'm going to get another one off in the time that I have. I'm going to see if I could ripple fire, but I don't think we'll get a chance to do that, so we'll break off and head around for another run. And let's see how we did. Took out an M113. And as I said, as we uh, exit the range here, as we clear from the range, we'll get an automatic um, target information tracking system accuracy message. In this case, it's not really going to tell us much we didn't know. So we'll just set up to go around here. There we go. Not surprisingly, uh, we came very close to our target, although it is good to know that uh, we launched actually from... Uh, altitude 7,000 feet and at a range, slant range of actually 8 kilometers. Okay, let's go around and this time I'm going to skip forward uh, and we'll actually move right on to the IR uh, Mavericks and this time let's see if we can actually uh, be a little bit faster off the mark and see if we can actually get two of them fired in the same run.
All right, so we're coming around again like the last time. So an interesting thing to note about the A-10 is that it actually is the first attack aircraft that was designed for the U.S. Air Force. The uh, other attack aircraft that the uh, specific attack aircraft, so A-series aircraft, that the U.S. Air Force had flown had both been designed for the U.S. Navy, which was uh, not something that the Air Force was particularly happy about. They'd flown the A-1 Sky Raider, which they kind of liked, and then they kind of had the A-7 Corsair II kind of forced down their throat uh, by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in the late 1960s, and it never really sat very well with the Air Force, so they began designing their own aircraft, which ultimately became the A-10. But it really was the first attack aircraft that the Air Force designed. All right, rolling in now with our IR Mavericks. So uh, targets are going to be uh, hot. Targets are going to be white on a black background here. Works the same way. We're just going to get the uh, reticle over the general target area, ground stabilize it, and then go looking for targets. Try and pick them up a little bit more quickly this time, so we can maybe get two. And we zoom in. They're looking for a target. There they are. Got one. All right. Oops. Yes. Let's go with that one. Keep it down the center line. And rifle. Okay. Once the smoke clears, let's go looking for another one. A little bit closer here. Yeah, that's the AM113 we got before. It's not wanting to lock onto it, I think, because we already engaged it. Let's see. Oh, there's another one. Let's go for that one. And rifle. And now we can break away. We have plenty of standoff. I lost a little bit more altitude that time following the, the sight down, but I don't think that was a bad run. Uh, got two missiles away in one run. So while we're waiting for our confirmation from the target information tracking system, um, we should talk a little bit about the A-10. Um, the A-10 really was the product of the U.S. experience both in the Second World War, the Korean War, and then more importantly in Vietnam, and, and to some extent I think um, some of the early Israeli experience uh, in the Middle East. And the big shift that had happened was that in the Second World War in Korea, the solution to being more survivable in the air-to-ground role was basically to gain altitude. Uh, and so um, the emphasis had been, as, and you can see that as you move from the, uh, from the P-47 up to the Sabre and even the A-4, that they started off uh, trying to become better at uh, dive bombing at high altitudes um, because it was just becoming very difficult to survive at low altitudes with the amount of flak that was around. But what happened in the Vietnam War was that suddenly with the advent of surface-to-air missiles, uh, aircraft were really denied the opportunity to operate at altitude. And so what was needed was an aircraft that was able to operate at low altitude and survive the threat. And that's what the A-10 was designed to do. Okay, so we've got our Mark 82 selected and we're in CCIP mode, continuously computed impact mode. So we're basically going to get a, a reticle that shows us where the bombs are going to land on the ground and all we have to do is put that over the target. Now, one of the other things about the A-10 uh, was the way it was designed was for visibility. You can see, compared to the earlier fighters, particularly like the P-47, our over-the-nose uh, visibility is much better, and so we don't actually have to put the target off our wingtip and then roll in. We can actually uh, get into a shallow dive towards it, and then when we're ready, we can roll in. And once we do that, though, we're going to use the same technique we always do. We get the flight path vector over the target, and we're going to pull that flight path vector up, we're going to hold it in a spot, and we're going to wait for the CCI pipper to come up and cross the target. And there it is. And there's the pickle. And there's the result. So, as you can see, the A-10 is definitely taking a lot of the guesswork out of delivering iron bombs. Uh, really, that was a pretty uh, low-intensity approach, but it was an accurate drop, and we dropped the bombs at over 4,000 feet, which would be an unheard-of altitude to get that kind of accuracy, really, in any aircraft that had gone before. Even the A-10, even the A-4, with the bombing computer, would be pretty hard to drop 
at 4,000 feet and get inside a 10 meter circle. So we're just going to continue now. You can see the uh, green lights there lit for the uh, Mark 82s. We're just going to continue with the Mark 82s. This time we're going to use the CCRP system. Uh, CCRP stands for Continuously Computed Release Point. Um, so in this case, what we're basically going to do is pre-designate the target and then the bombing computer is going to release the bombs when it thinks that the, the uh, time is right. This is actually the way that the uh, A4 bombing computer actually works. If you think about it, you dive in, you put the crosshair on the target, you, you pickle and hold, and the bombing computer figures out when to release your bombs. Now, the difference is in the A4 is that you get no cues about how level your wings are. Um, so you can still um, lose a lot of accuracy if you don't stay level and if you pull up too hard and don't pull up straight. But as you'll see, the cues here will help us with that. So that big round dashed circle is our target designation cue. We're going to try and put it over the white building that's part of the target area there. And then we're just going to designate. I'm just going to bring it up a little bit here. And uh, there or there. Okay, so now it's designated. It's the little square. We have to keep the square on the bomb fall line, and when it gets into the middle of the circle, the bombs will go. And we can pull away. See how we did here in just a sec. Yeah, that looks like a pretty good hit. We'll let the target information tracking system tell us. So, uh, we put those again uh, within 15 meters of the target. Uh, dropped that time at 4,700 feet. Uh, and again, uh, we probably could have even dropped higher if we would wanted to be a little bit more aggressive. So you can see the A-10 has really provided you the opportunity uh, to deliver weapons in a much more survivable way, provided uh, you can operate at this altitude. Of course, the issue is going to be uh, if you're in a SAM denied zone, you really uh, your life expectancy over uh, a thousand feet um, is not going to be that high. So you're actually going to need to spend a little bit more time close to the ground, and that's when the A-10 survivability is really going to come into play. The aircraft is designed to survive 23 millimeter cannon strikes, and also the design of the engines. Uh, they're they're high bypass turbofan engines, which don't generate as much heat signature, and they're up high above the fuselage, which hides them to some extent from uh, MANPADS missiles, at least. They were pretty effective at, at um, countering first-generation MANPADS. Maybe they're less effective today. But when the aircraft was being designed in 1970, it was being specifically designed to defeat the early MANPADS threat. So I think we've done enough with the iron bombs. Let's get in a little bit closer, and uh, let's take a look at what some 2.75-inch rockets can do. Uh, and now we're getting down to real, really basic iron bombing. Um, as fighter pilots uh, will always have always maintained, uh, if you really want to do some damage to a target, the best way to do it is to strafe it. Uh, especially during the Second World War, this was very much the preferred attack method, at least for targets that didn't have a lot of uh, defenses, uh, was either used to gun or rockets, and because it's a lot easier to hit something if it's out in front of you than if you're flying over top of it. Now, the CCIP and CCRP have made that less true, uh, but it's still uh, very satisfying to engage a target that you can see coming. So we've got a concentration of soft vehicles down there. They used to be in a line, but they've moved in response to our Maverick strikes. I just need to find them there. And then we're just going to put the rocket cursor in the middle of them. There they are. And we're going to let them have it. Pull up. Pull up. Oh, I'll pull up once I've fired my rockets. There we go. As I said, that's a very satisfying amount of destruction in the middle of those targets. Really not a whole lot different uh, between that approach and what we would do in the P-47 uh, or the F-86. Been a staple of a ground attack aircraft for more than 70 years. Now one thing I'm showing you here is that something new in the target information tracking system now is that it actually allows you to get a grouped impact results. So instead of trying to read 38 different impacts, you can actually get an average. I'm not entirely sure how valuable that data is because the trucks weren't where they were uh, originally set up to be on the range, but uh, at least now you know that if you want to use uh, 
target information tracking uh, system version 2.1, it does have the grouped target results, which is very useful when you're doing things like rockets. So, well, so that's rockets. We've done bombs. Uh, we've done uh, our newfangled Mavericks. Um, but let's now go really old school. Let's get on with using uh, the weapon that the A-10 was designed to carry, and that's the GAU-8. Uh, the GAU-8 is a 7-barreled, 30mm Gatling gun that is over two, almost 2.5 two meters long and has an effective range of over 1,200 meters. And the aircraft was not only designed around carrying the cannon itself, but also 1,150 rounds to go with it, so you don't really have to ration the hurt. Now, once again, in order to use the GAU-8, you're definitely going to be inside uh, the threat envelope of um, AAA and even man pads, and that's why the A-10 was designed to be so survivable. If you're going to use this weapon, uh, you need to expect to be looking at uh, some enemy ground fire. But unlike, uh, as we've seen with the P-47 and certainly with the F-86, the A-10 is n designed not to be fragile to the kinds of threats that you're going to be facing, or at least that you would have been facing in the 1970s. So we're just getting ourselves lined up looking for some targets down there. There's some tanks near the back of the range that I'm going to give it a try at. They're actually World War II vintage tanks. Just cheating a little bit, but hey, what the heck. And if you've ever watched videos online, and there are plenty of them of the A-10s in action, there really is absolutely no sound in the world like the hog chewing on a target. So let's go do that right now. So we're going to roll in. We're going to put the flight path vector just a little bit underneath the target area there. And then we'll switch to the gun. And then we'll pull it up slowly. Don't let it get up too far. It'll be a little bit beyond the target, I think. And we're down to one kilometer. Anytime now, we get it stabilized. And there's, there's the lo lovely sound of the GAU-8 in action. Now, the A-10A uh, DCS version does not have... Um, the gun stabilization mode that the A-10C does. When you fly in the A-10C, the first trigger detent stabilizes the aircraft uh, for when you pull the trigger. The A-10A doesn't implement that. It's a little bit harder to use the cannon, but it isn't any less fun. All right, well, that's the A-10A on the range. We have fired Mavericks, we have dropped bombs, we have fired rockets, and we have used the gun. That's about all we've got time for today. Other than to maybe do a little bit of a wing over, go back and take a look at what we have wrought on the ground. So, hope you enjoyed this little range tour with the uh, A 10A, the ultimate iron bomber. As I said, uh, if you uh, are actually interested in learning a little bit more about the A 10A, um, I can certainly make another video that's a little bit more of a tutorial about actually just flying the aircraft and especially using that new clickable cockpit mod. Uh, do like the video if that's what you want or leave me a comment uh, or just come to my Discord channel and let me know. For now, this is going to be Sidekick, signing off.